And as you can see, I changed the, my affiliation. I'm now at the University of South Florida. I'm a visiting research fellow there. And I will be talking about the archaeology of a globalization, nothingness, problems and solutions for future <laughs> narratives. So something uh, less uh, um, data oriented and a little bit more uh, theoretical. So start with uh, globalization. What is uh, globalization? Uh, there are many ways of uh, perceiving it. It's certainly not something new. Uh, you can see here a map uh, from uh, the uh, 17th century, 18th century that uh, already starts to form uh, the, the, the world view. And uh, you can see other maps and uh, uh, created uh, for, uh, for example, from the flights, uh, you know, the airlines, how they connect uh, the world or uh, the internet, uh, the major hubs uh, connecting the various uh, areas. And you can see that uh, uh, TV, for example, I mean, we have uh, many channels, uh, very often also uh, foreign channels. So globalization is always increasing and creeping up. And we noticed that uh, probably more, uh, more of it uh, recently, but it's a trend uh, that has been going on uh, for uh, forever. Um, the globalized world uh, can be really mentioned uh, in with, with, with many terms. Uh, I have uh, just a quick list of mobility movement, uh, spread of people and technologies, exchanges, trade, uh, contacts, influences, intercultural, conquest, colonization, empire. By themselves, uh, there are many different facets of um, archaeology, but uh, they all point to mobility, uh, to something that is, uh, becomes, uh, you know, something together, a mixing of cultures, even colonization itself. I mean, uh, we know that there is colonial archaeology, but in reality, I mean, what is colonization, uh, especially in the past, it's, uh, it's really two cultures meeting and one taking the, the prevailing on the other, but the Romans, for example, were doing exactly the same, and before the Greeks. Uh, and so it's uh, something that is always part of uh, some globalization form, whether it is violent, uh, pacific, or uh, you know, peaceful, or uh, whatever. It's uh, it's it's uh, something um, that is always related to globalization. And we have also some uh, theories, archaeological theories, uh, that, uh, you know, core periphery, world systems uh, from Wallerstein, globalization, localization, after, uh, you know, uh, it was brought uh, up that uh, localization is always important, interconnectedness, and uh, network analysis. So we have, um, I think, a couple of uh, sessions uh, that are running uh, in this uh, very EAA meeting, and uh, they are all uh, aspects of the same thing of a globalized world that is, uh, uh, I mean, different approaches really to investigate this world. And in reality, I mean, humans have always been social and there are always mobility, uh, even in the Paleolithic, and there is uh, always uh, uh, something, you know, uh, some merging uh, of some kind of uh, cultures. Uh, um, it's a really isolation that is unusual. It's very rare to find a closed context uh, that is, uh, uh, you know, without any influence. And as I mentioned, well, uh, global and local have become uh, two keywords in archaeology, and uh, also there are some uh, uh, glocal, which is uh, some form of globalization that also looks at uh, localization. And we have always to consider that every time a social system is built, it will grow in complexity. And uh, that is uh, uh, simply how it is. And then there are, uh, you know, changes. Uh, so also globalization, as I mentioned, has grown and uh, changed a little bit. Um, but, uh, but it is a trend that, uh, that is uh, really detectable already from the very deep past. And uh, here we see some uh, environments. I want to really to bring uh, some attention to the local. And uh, here you have a woodland, uh, uh, urban areas, uh, deserts, uh, and what's not. And all these environments can, uh, uh, you know, bring uh, some perspective to people and cultures. But perspective then uh, can be quite different and change. Uh, we see here, for example, from uh, the space age, um, the, the Earth seen from the moon, 
pun from space and uh, and uh, uh, you know uh, it's it's a completely different perspective uh, in a way but it is always uh, you know our environment and now we we don't see anymore you know our immediate environment we see a broader environment but we still don't live in uh, in the world uh, itself uh, in the whole world we still live in a place whatever that might be and so sometimes when we started to enlarge our view it becomes richer but uh, it might lead also to, to do nothingness because we start to lose uh, who we are and what we are doing uh, really as uh, people, not just as archaeologists. And uh, as archaeologists, uh, we certainly started to lose uh, where to focus. Uh, should we focus on the local? Should we focus on the interaction? Should we focus on the broader view generalization? All of it, none of it. Um, I suggest uh, simply that uh, let's look also at science. Uh, just the previous speaker mentioned that, uh, well, archaeology is a science, and I believe uh, so. I mean, we certainly have uh, to stick uh, to certain rules uh, that make uh, archaeology as scientific as possible in its uh, quest for some truth. And here I just present uh, a couple of pictures. One is, uh, the first one is uh, really particle physics. They are looking really at uh, the foundational particle. And we have gone uh, from the atom that was already theorized uh, by Epicurus uh, to the nucleus, a nucleon, quark, and maybe uh, even uh, smaller particles. And uh, we have uh, the DNA that is uh, the, the basis of life and uh, the amino acids. And so even in science, we try always to look at the foundation. What is the minimal element? In archaeology, I think we should do the same. We should start uh, to look at what are the elements, the, the, the basic elements that interact, and uh, not really try to pursue um, immediately, you know, without knowing the foundational blocks, uh, these broader views that uh, could uh, lose track of the local cultures and uh, the archaeological record. I think that uh, local culture, intended uh, really in archaeological sense, is uh, uh, quite important and uh, we have uh, uh, really to get it right. It's uh, really, w we excavate, we study material culture and that is what uh, archaeology is about uh, in its uh, basic uh, principle and we have to start uh, there. Anything that uh, really uh, excludes in some way the archaeological record that doesn't consider it uh, uh, as the focal point, as uh, its uh, starting point, really, uh, should be uh, really excluded. Uh, and uh, that doesn't mean that we don't have uh, to make a generalization or a broader views, but they have uh, to be informed from the archaeological record. So there, are, there has been a long period, for example, with the theory that, uh, that was uh, really a way to create a model, but uh, in abstract, mm -hmm. without uh, really any, any foundation on, uh, on the archaeological record, or sometimes to look at a single archaeological record and build a model uh, that was very broad. In reality, we need uh, uh, to look at uh, multiple local cultures, multiple archaeological records, different sites, and then from there, see the interactions of what elements, uh, you know, uh, are really uh, relevant for any interaction and from there build a, a, a broader picture of what is uh, 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 what might be a generalization or uh, what's not uh, we shouldn't really go uh, for a forum uh, simple theory um, we we have uh, spoken uh, a lot about uh, big picture, broad uh, long durée, uh, long term history and di dynamics, uh, world histories, diffusionist models, and uh, they all, you know, are really facets of uh, aspects of the same of the same uh, globalization. So we have uh, really to understand that globalization is uh, really. Um, the interaction, the basic interaction, is uh, the product of basic interaction. Um, there are, for example, now uh, there is a trend on deep history that is to look at uh, 
you know, from the Paleolithic to modern times, uh, really look at very, very long periods. Um, but sometimes uh, you, I mean, uh, it's uh, useful in a way because uh, it's always humans, it's always, uh, you know, certain things are uh, obviously recurrent and you can find uh, in any context maybe some, uh, some point of contact. But I think that um, it's a problem sometimes when uh, you lose sight of, uh, you know, what is the local, what is uh, really the life uh, of an individual at some point or what uh, decisions these uh, people might have made uh, to interact, uh, what kind of influence uh, they might be, you know, slaughtered sometimes. Sometimes uh, they might change a little, as we have uh, heard from uh, Drago, so it might be just uh, a slow change. Uh, uh, because they learn something new. Sometimes it might be dramatic, uh, an environmental disaster, a flooding, for example, and they immediately understand uh, that uh, they need to react to it. It can be you know, something that, uh, that is simply even uh, uh, mid-term. Mid I mean, uh, some, they meet another culture or a new culture is formed, a new fashion, and they start to change uh, their material culture and uh, their, their ideas. So we need uh, always to anchor a little bit our ideas on uh, the material record. I think that sometimes when we have uh, these very broad views, uh, we tend to, to miss uh, what people really were, uh, were doing. Uh, and it is dangerous because uh, then uh, there might be a trend, uh, a very broad trend uh, that uh, you, know, you, can, uh, you can recognize, but that is uh, not necessarily um, what people meant or what uh, people perceive is happening. And uh, always remember that when you see a trend uh, that is very long term, uh, so, you know, thousands and thousands of years, um, it might be not uh, that true. I mean, any environmental catastrophe, any new influence, any colonization, uh, anything that, uh, that uh, you know, is disruptive and can happen, it can change this trend. Sometimes there might be a trend to something and then, uh, you know, it is stopped. Sometimes they just go on. Today, for example, we would say that technology is driving our, uh, our society in many ways. I mean, it changes it uh, very, very uh, frequently. But uh, there might be a point where uh, we get used to technology and we say, well, uh, I don't want, uh, you know, a new smartphone. I'm okay with what I have. Uh, and so certain trends can, can slow down. And so we don't have to, to, to make it too many conclusions from this uh, broader, broad thing. So we have to really see the impact of things on, on real people. Um, and so exactly, uh, local contexts and cultures must be really at the heart of what we do. I think that uh, commercial archaeology in particular has been uh, very successful in uh, 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 really uh, investigating uh, in, in recent times uh, local areas because uh, they are really unlike uh, academias and universities, uh, you know, academic people, they are not doing research uh, here and there or what they fancy, but really uh, at certain territory. And that is also very important, I think, uh, for archaeologists to, to take notice that uh, there are a growing data sets uh, really for, uh, for a certain loca uh, locale and they needed also to, to really use it and not just leave it uh, or it's uh, data from commercial archaeology or, you know, and uh, it's uh, nothing that we, we should be bothered about. I mean, we needed to create also histories and narratives that are uh, uh, local and that uh, uh, can, be, can be told to people within a certain region. And this uh, leads uh, me to indeed, uh, discuss a moment about uh, narrative. I think that uh, this is what we agree is the final product uh, of archaeology, that is a narrative, producing a narrative that explains as much as possible. It tells us in a way what we know physically, what material culture is there, what data we have, but also how we explain it. And I think it is very important uh, that we understand uh, that it's not uh, a simple scientific uh, uh, result uh, that uh, we can say, you know, one plus one equals two, and that is the solution, and there is nothing else uh, to add. We, we really have, uh, I mean, data, 
that we needed to gather scientifically and investigate scientifically, but then we needed to come to a conclusion, to a narrative, and that is very much uh, rooted in social sciences, and we needed to really understand that it's equally important to us uh, to present those data to people. Um, we have to present uh, those uh, data in particular to the people that are within a certain region. I think that uh, it is uh, a dangerous trend nowadays to lose a little bit. Uh, even, even in our own profession, we were uh, moving sometimes, you know, from one place to the other and losing contact uh, really with uh, any particular area. We might feel in touch with a particular cultural area but then, uh, you know, even going outside of the town or uh, uh, maybe, you know, another country, uh, in our case, it can be something that uh, you lose basically um, contact with a specific culture. And I think that a lot of people, you know, with increased mobility, even for, for ordinary jobs, they are uh, losing a little bit uh, uh, touch with uh, who they are, uh, where they are, and there is also the community that changes with immigration. You know, not just even if you are, uh, you know, living there and have lived there forever. Uh, also, the past generations, you might see that the society ca uh, changes around you. New people arise, so there is an in increasing need to really refound this uh, society and give them uh, some glue, some, some point, uh, 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 some focal point uh, that uh, they can, uh, they can uh, look forward, uh, they can, uh, an identity really, that uh, um, can uh, bring them together. And I think that a narrative that explains uh, the territory and the changes in the territory would, uh, would be ideal for these people to really regain uh, some uh, contact uh, with, uh, with, uh, the, uh, with uh, the land that they live on, and maybe not uh, the land that they uh, uh, were born uh, in, or uh, they, 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 it might be that it changed, they think that it changed, but if they have a sense that uh, it wasn't always static, it's just that now it changes more you know, rapidly, and uh, they are part of uh, an historical trend uh, that uh, started much earlier, and they, are, they belong there in some way. That would help also, I think, uh, politics, uh, some extremism uh, would uh, go, and those archaeologists would, uh, would be helped, because then you make a relevant, you know, you make archaeology relevant to people. And uh, here you see just an example of a stratigraphic uh, record, you know, this shouldn't be just uh, fun uh, for people to come and, uh, you know, make a dig. Uh, as we have seen with Dragos, it should be something that we really uh, bring, uh, I mean, uh, the data from this, uh, uh, from these ex excavations and from, from, from our museums, really, to people, translate them to people into, into narratives so they, they can, uh, they can uh, understand and so they can appropriate uh, the, 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 their past, uh, their, uh, their land. Um, I think that uh, uh, that is something we needed to do. Um, it's, uh, you know, there are many, many ideas, but uh, so far um, um, some confusion on what to do. There are community archaeology projects uh, and bringing, you know, people into archaeology projects uh, with uh, even art, uh, uh, at the same EAA. But uh, there is a strong disconnection between territory and, uh, and, uh, and people, that are the, the, the place that they live on and, uh, and the society that is, uh, that is there now, nowadays. Um, archaeology is uh, really the, the only discipline that uh, can bring them in touch again, uh, land and people. And uh, we can create uh, perspectives that are both global and local. You know, we can tell people, you belong to this territory, to this land, but we can also show them uh, a broader picture and say, and this land and this people also belongs to the world. So we can, uh, we can shape a little bit of the understanding of people, uh, of ordinary people, you know, of, um, uh, even uneducated people, uh, people that is outside academia. 
Um, I absolutely think that therefore narratives need to be understood by by everyone. That uh, we don't have uh, to stop there at uh, you know the academic report or the technical report for commercial archaeologists. We really need uh, to to go beyond and uh, engage the, the public. So very quickly, the conclusions. Um, I think uh, that uh, uh, we need uh, to to really target uh, this. Uh, uh, narratives that can be uh, more broad in the sense of more engaging for different audiences, both academia and public, I think uh, that uh, we needed to uh, make something, you know, not just uh, our uh, own interpretation, uh, you know, that uh, what we are interested on, in, but also make it a little bit more useful, our interpretation and uh, present a history and uh, really become a little bit of storytellers uh, may uh, produce a story that uh, makes some sense. Eventually, even sometimes saying, "Well, we don't know how they might live, uh, but uh, have lived uh, for for these aspects." But we can imagine that, so we know that uh, you know it's not from data. But give us uh, some some kind of idea, and start uh, basically you know scientifically in terms of approach, but also more engaging. And uh, we need uh, really to break barriers of uh, time and. Uh, uh, area, uh, particularly with uh, with archaeology, you know, you can say Bronze Age, Neolithic, uh, or a classical, uh, and we need a little bit to to break uh, barriers and uh, show that uh, there is more continuity. Um, and really, the world is going to be ever more globalized. Uh, it's a trend that started uh, really in the past, uh, and uh, because of this globalization, there is more interaction and there is more complexity. So we really need to, uh, to, to adapt to it. Um, we need to target uh, the for broader audiences. And uh, we absolutely need to engage also politically against the extremism. If we have uh, you know, data that show that uh, there was change, there was immigration, uh, I, I can recall uh, here uh, uh, Mary Beard, uh, that is a classicist at the Cambridge University, for example, and she mm, very recently mentioned on social media that uh, in uh, Roman Britain there was uh, uh, some uh, et ethnical uh, diversity and probably even black people because uh, there were Africans uh, from, from the Roman uh, uh, army that were in Britain, and she was uh, uh, literally ass verbally assaulted because uh, people would not accept that. And I think uh, that it is important to engage people and tell them, uh, look, uh, uh, there is nothing like, uh, for example, the native uh, Breton that is uh, some pure white and, uh, you know, it's different from Europe, uh, but it could be anywhere. I mean, it's not just, uh, you know, Britain is just an example. Um, and we need uh, really to, to challenge this view so if we have a uh, data we can't be silent anymore. We really need to, to, to participate more and engage the public. Well, thank you very much.